Welcome to the Deli Dixon's channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between a sociopath and a psychopath. Now, I do a lot of podcasts like this. I'll usually put the link for the article that I'm reading in the description. I usually read it word for word, but here and there I interject my own two cents. And I'm always a smart ass. This topic is something I was talking about, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but I don't mention people's names and stuff, but I get inspiration to do some of these things on certain topics I talk with with certain friends. So we'll dive into this, and this is going to be, I might do two, depending on how long it is, and I'm not sure if they overlap, because they're going to overlap in information, but I'm not sure if I chose these two because I am somewhat disorganized and like to turn the mic on but these two were in the folder and um not sure if there's too much overlap but we'll see the first one will be simply psychology that's the website i think yes and how sociopaths are different from psychopaths by charlotte roll hmm that's interesting like I said, I'll put the um, links in the description, and we'll see how that works out. Usually, I put it in, or I can always edit it and put it in, but this should be okay. I'll start reading now, and it has some little article parts in it. It says, take-home messages. Both psychopathy and sociopathy. Sociopathy. <laughs> I'm, starting right, I'm starting good right off the bat. You'll also be entertained by how I butcher the English language. Both <laughs> psychopathy and sociopathy, also re referred to as antisocial personality disorder or ASPD, are characterized by a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. A sociopath is a person with a personality disorder that is marked by traits of impulsivity, risk-taking, and violence. A psychopath is a person who has an antisocial personality disorder characterized by a lack of regard for the rights and feelings of others, controlled and manipulative, manipulative behavior, the absence of shame, and an inability to form emotional relationships. Deceit and manipulation are essential aspects of both personality types. However, even though they are often confused for one another because they manifest in similar ways, these, two, these are two distinct forms of personality disorders. Although the lifetime prevalence of both of these disorders is roughly 1%, because of the violent acts individuals with these disorders often commit, and society's fascination with this, be, this disorder, they are often the protagonist of a film or the headline of a newspaper. In addition to the unique way in which these two disorders are diagnosed, their unique histories and the different treatments approaches, the key difference between the two is that psychopathy has an effective and interpersonal domain that is not related to ASPD. <laughs> oh man, this is going to be great. Psychopath versus sociopath. See, now that I could say pretty good. It's when they start adding the fucking Y at the end. Although, <laughs> sociopathy and psychopathy can manifest in very similar ways, it's important to understand that these diagnoses Diagnosis are not interchangeable. And while the average person, the average lay person, will often label any serial killer or someone who engages in heinous acts of violence as having one of these two disorders, not all violent people are psychopaths or sociopaths. How sociopaths are different from psychopaths? Aside from the difference in the way these two are diagnosed, their unique histories, and the different methods used to treat these disorders. The key distinction is that 
Psychopathy possesses a unique, effective, and interpersonal domain that is not related to sociopathy. Both disorders have an antisocial, deviant domain, but characteristics such as shallowness, callous lack of empathy, and emotional detachment are uniquely psychopathic traits. Now, there's a little blurb here. Both psycho psychopathy and sociopathy, now referred to as antipersonality disorder or ASPD, are classified as personality disorders. But what are personality disorders? Personality is what makes you who is what makes you who are. This is fucking a typo or something. Is what makes you who you are. So how can that be disordered? What are personality disorders? In psychological terms, personality is defined as the way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that makes you unique and distinguishes you from others. Your genetics, environment, and experiences affect your personality. And unlike temporary moods or emotions, personality trait typically stays relatively stable over the course of your lifetime. Personality typically stays relatively stable. Okay. And this is Robits 2000. I guess it's a link to a uh, article or a study, maybe. An individual is diagnosed with a personality disorder when their thoughts, feelings, and behavioral patterns deviate from cultural norms and expectations, cause distress or significant problems functioning in society, and persist over a long period of time. American Psychological Association, 2013. Okay, so they're, they're putting in little things, which is interesting. Which is kind of half bullshit in a way, you know, because it's telling you it's from the cultural norms, right? So, all right, we'll continue. Typically, personality disorders affect the way you think about yourself and others, the way you respond emotionally, the way you relate to other people, and the way you control your behavior. Some examples of personality disorders are borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. This article, however, will focus on two specific personality disorders, psychopathy and antisocial, antisocial personality disorder. Although both only affect a tiny percentage of the population, ASPD and psychopathy are frequently depicted in film and television. Additionally, Violence can be a consequence of these disorders, so gruesome acts of murder and abuse often make national headlines. Because these disorders are often depicted on the big screen and on the news, and because they manifest in similar ways, they are often conflated and confused for one another. However, it is important to understand that these two distinct disorders, each with separate symptoms and diagnostic criteria, so as to avoid mislabeling an individual. And again, as a little thing, broadly speaking, a diagnosis of sociopathy, ASPD, is based on an individual's behavior, whereas psychopathy in includes an interpersonal and affective dimension. Wow. They keep putting that in there here and then. <clears throat> All right, well, I guess we'll get to it. A common way of distinguishing between the two is describing the individual describing an individual with ASPD as hot headed. This person has a quick temper and acts in impulsive and erratic ways. An individual with psychopathy as cold hearted. This person is calculating and lacks any empathy or emotion. Well I think studies are saying that it's actually a switch they can turn on and off. That's with new neurology and studies. See, if I did it right job, i do like a fucking hour, two hour thing and have all this. Maybe I'll do that one day. I'll get like people to come on the show. I wonder who I would ask. Hmm. All right. What is a psychopath? Individuals with psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, display a decrease of emotional response and lack of empathy with others. The individual might possess a superficial charm, but deep down is manipulative and impulsive. 
A psychopath is characterized by a lack of regard for the rights and feelings of others, controlled and manipulative behavior, the absence of shame, and the inability to form emotional relationships. More in 2021. There's a study, I guess, or something. They are incapable of loyalty to individuals, groups, or social values. They are grossly selfish, callous, irresponsible, impulsive, and unable to feel guilt or to learn from experience. Psychopathy is extremely uncommon. It is estimated that only 0.5 to 1% of the population meets the criteria for this disorder. And there's a little thing, why in 2012? It is even less common among women. One study found that 11% of female violent subjects are psychopaths. But 31% of male violent subjects can be accurately labeled with this disorder. That's interesting. Fucking women. Additionally, while as high as 20 to 25% of the prison population qualifies for the diagnosis, only 16% of females who are incarcerated meet the criteria for psychopathy. That's the 97 study, I guess. But these statistics have not always been common knowledge, or even knowledge at all for that matter. When was psychopathy first studied, and how has our understanding of disorder evolved over time? The origin of psychopathy. From Medea, from Medea to King <laughs> Sharia. Is that a fucking... That's like a fantasy novel, right? In the Book of 1001 Nights, psychopathy has always existed in historical myths and stories. Academic writing about disorder dates back all the way to ancient Greece, when one, when one of Aristotle, Aristotle's students, Theoprastus, <laughs> uh, was possibly, I'm not even fucking bothering, okay? was possibly the first to write about psychopaths, labeling them as the unscrupulous. Put simply, Theoprastus was describing people without empathy or conscience. Centuries later, centuries and centuries later, one of the first medical professionals to describe psychopaths was, wow, French doctor Philippe Pinel. In 1806, Pinel called this condition Maniac Sans Delire. <laughs> or Insanity Without Delirium. One of his students, <laughs> Jean Etienne Dominique Esquirol, called it. <laughs> La folie raisonnette. 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 Whatever the fuck that is. Raisonnette. Or rational madness. Another popular term that was used in the U.S. and England throughout the 19th and early 20th century was moral insanity. See, I could say that. While different and certainly not terms that would be accepted today, these terms all create an image of a psychopath as someone who is insane or mad. But how did the word psychopath come about? In, in 1888, German psychiatrist J.L.A. Koch was credited with being the first to use the term <laughs> psychopastiche. <laughs> Psychopathic in German. Alright, so I had to say that. I said it like I was a fucking Italian or something. Meaning suffering soul. As the turn of the 20th century, the diagnostic criteria for psychopathy began to take shape and evolve. Although it was first defined as a lack of moral core, the so-called German school of psychopathy expanded the diagnosis to, in to incorporate people who hurt themselves and others. Oh, that's interesting. Though the first, though it was first defined as a lack of moral, 
The so-called Germany School of Psychopathy Experiments incorporate people who hurt them. Man, Germans, man. When the Great Depression hit in the late 1920s, psychiatry was using the word psychopath to include people who were depressed, shy, and insecure. Generally speaking, the term was used to label anyone who was deemed abnormal. Hmm. I'm trying to see a trend here. Beginning in the late 1930s and transitioning into the early 40s, two academic works of literature, literature were published. The first was Psychopathic States by Scottish Psychiatrist David Henderson, which focused on his observations of a psychopath as someone who, in many ways, is perfectly rational and capable of achieving egocentric goals. Hmm. Two years later, American psychiatrist Herv- Hervey Cleckley Hervey Cleckley published his famous Mask of Sanity. Cleckley <laughs> describes clinical interviews he had with patients who were in a locked institution and outlines basic traits he associates with psychopathy. The title refers to the normal mask that conceals a person's psych- psychopathic tendencies. This work was instrumental to understanding this disorder and making the concept of psychopathy more concrete. Jumping forward a decade, the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Mind, DSM, was published in 1952 and grouped psychopathy under sociopathic personality disturbance. Hmm. Effective and behavioral criteria were diagnosed separately as antisocial reaction and dissocial reaction. In 1968, the DSM 2 joined these two together under the category antisocial personality. And in 1980, the DSM 3 defined psychopathy as a persistent violation of social norms and drop the effective traits altogether. Today, psychopathy is no longer part of the DSM, but ASPD, which we will discuss later, remains a part of this diagnostic manual. Etiology. Similar to the causes of most mental disorders, the causes of psychopathy are not understood too well. Nevertheless, research has demonstrated that it is highly correlated with abnormal brain activity that is a product of both genetics and very early developmental problems. In other words, both nature and nurture play a role in the development of psychopathy. Typically, an individual will have a genetic predisposition to psychopathy, and then a poor environment allows this disorder to manifest in their lives. Specifically, Research done by developmental psychologist Robert Keegan revealed that an abnormally slow rate of brain development causes psychopaths to be essentially frozen in time, such as they never grow out of the egocentricity, impulsiveness, and selfishness that marks adolescence. This is, this is really interesting. Hmm. You know, when you look at this part here, how it says nurture and nature, this leads me to believe, like, when you, when you get correlated and connected things, it's one of the reasons why I implore people to breathe and meditate. And I mean, mostly breathing exercises to control your body, and then a little bit of meditation or an understanding of how your brain is working and emotions and thoughts and feelings. Teaching it at a young age could inoculate people to these type of things. So maybe you were born with this predisposition genetically to have these disorders. However, 
part of it is environment and nurture, right? So maybe you could teach kids at a young age to breathe and focus and work through their emotions and their brain states. And, and I think it could help, but I'm not a fucking doctor, right? All right, so how is it diagnosed? Accurately diagnosing an individual with psychopathy is an incredibly crucial task because the disorder is so highly stigmatized in society, especially within the media and popular culture. A positive diagnosis can come with an incredibly pejorative label. In 1980, Canadian psychologist Robert Hare developed the Psychopathy Checklist, and there's a link here highlighted, PCL, a universal tool that is distilled the wide-ranging characteristics of this condition into a 20-item inventory. Though administering a semi-structured interview and receiving the client's personal files, clinicians rely on the PCL to provide a reliable and valid measure of a construct that has direct implications for mental health and the criminal justice system. I was talking to some another friend about this, where you have a, you know, checklist and you, know, you put people into certain brain states and uh, different types uh, all right the checklist distinguishes between two different diagnostic factors factor one describes effective criteria and factor two contains socially deviant criteria the instrument requires cl clinicians clinicians yeah to give <laughs> a score on each of the 20 total items on a scale from zero, item does not fit, to two, item definitely fits. Thus, the minimum score is zero, and the maximum score is a 40. Here, define psychopathy as a score of 30 or more, excluding most individuals with ASPD, since these individuals are less likely to exhibit interpersonal and effective traits. In 2003, Hare revised the checklist and broke up the two factors into four. See more in the next section. This new tool, the PCL-R, offer revised, is used by clinicians today to diagnose psychopathy. That same year, Hare co-authored the psychopathy checklist youth version, PCLYV. Wow. To assess Psychopathic traits in youth. As uh, signs and symptoms. As previously mentioned, Hare revised the original PCL to instead include four separate factors. These factors capture the key signs and symptoms of psychopathy and are as follows. One. Well, factor one, interpersonal. One is glib, superficial charm. Two, grandiose sense of self-worth. Three, pathological lying. Four, conning, manipulative. Factor two, effective. One, lack of remorse or guilt. Two, emotionally shallow. Three, callous lack of empathy. Four, Failure to accept responsibility for own actions. Factor three, lifestyle. Need of stimulation, stimulation, proneness to boredom, boredom. Two, parasitic lifestyle. Three, lack of realistic long-term goals. Four, impulsivity. Five, irresponsibility. Factor four, antisocial. 1. Poor behavioral control. 2. Early behavioral problems. 3. Juvenile delinquency. 4. Revocation of conditional release. 5. Criminal versatility. And his 5 is other promiscuous sexual behavior and short term martial relationship. Now, it's not really finished, but. <laughs> you take pieces of this, and I know a lot of fucking psychopaths, I guess, and sociopaths, but. Oh, boy. 
Fun stuff. Fun stuff. Because the PCLR is scored on a scale from 0 to 40, it is possible and very likely that an individual will exhibit a combination of traits from all four of these buckets. And because there are 20 different items, it is also likely that two individuals who may be diagnosed with psychopathy will score very different on each item. In other words, no two cases of psychopathy will look the same. One individual might be a pathological liar in the corporate setting, and another might live a parasitic lifestyle and be unable to maintain meaningful emotional relationships. Although there are several manifestations of psychopathy, a common duality among psychopaths is that of successful and unsuccessful psychopaths. Successful versus unsuccessful psychopaths. A successful psychopath might sound like an oxymoron, but how can a psychopath, someone who is generally depicted as violent and devoid of emotion, be successful? Typically, an individual who is classified as a successful psychopath has intact neurological functioning which helps them achieve their goals with more nonviolent methods. Their amagala, amag, <laughs> the amagunglada, whatever, the amagladas and prefrontal cortex cortices have normal volumes, leading to better executive functioning and protecting them from conviction. Generally speaking, these individuals are able to achieve mock societal success whether it be through degrading employees, blaming others, or relying on deceptiveness, especially in the workplace. In a study conducted by Cynthia Matthew and colleagues, the researchers demonstrated ways in which successful psychopaths can affect the corporate workplace. Specifically, they found that psychopathic qualities of bosses negatively impacted employee performance and decreased their mood and well-being. They also detailed a direct relationship between an increased PCLR score and employer-employee distress and job satisfaction, such that a higher score predicts higher employee psychological distress and lower job satisfaction. On the other hand, unsuccessful psychopaths are those whose brains and autonomic nervous system have structural and functional impairments, causing more overt forms of offending, such as murder. (laughs) Offending murder, okay, you know, anyway. But there is definitely a gray area that is not a clear-cut distinction. Serial killers are often labeled as semi-successful psychopaths because they often engage in smart, premeditated acts and can avoid the police for some time. However, these acts are less subtle than that of of a successful psychopath, so it's more likely they will eventually be noticed. Research on successful versus unsuccessful psychopaths is not not the only avenue for empirical findings. There also exists an abundance of research pertaining to genetics, brain development, and specific traits and signs. Empirical research. Because genetics are half of the nature plus nurture equation, researchers have looked into the genetic ties to psychopathy. Specifically, a study conducted on twins found that 50% of the variance in antisocial behavior is attributed to genetics. Furthermore, the study identified seven genes, such as 5-HTT and BDNF, which are thought to influence brain structures and cause aggressive behavior. Another gene, MAOA, controls the production of a protein that breaks down brain signaling chemicals, such as dopamine and serotonin, and is thought to contribute to psychopathic behavior in individuals with a variant of this gene. This variant, MAOAL, produces less of the protein that breaks down these chemicals, causing such chemicals to build up and lead to impulsive behavior, mood swings, and violent tendencies. In addition to the genetic component, research studies have also identified 
anatomical differences in people who meet the diagnostic criteria for psychopathy. Both the amygdala, 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 <laughs> read the fucking article, all right? Um, I butcher this shit. And ventral medical prefrontal cortex, VMPFC, Christ, are key players in fear conditioning, socialization, decision making, and moral judgment. But individuals with psychopathy have been found to have reduced amyg amyg amygdala. That's it, right? Amygdala. I've heard that before. Okay. I was thinking of Amangala, the because uh, the guy in wrestling used to always say it. All right, so I'll go back. Have been found to have reduced amygdala volume and a 22% reduction in VMPFC gray matter. Other Research objectives have sought to debunk common misconceptions about psychopaths. One study found that, contrary to popular belief, psychopaths can discern moral wrongs. The researchers presented participants with eight moral and eight conventional stimuli and asked them to identify which eight were morally wrong in the absence of laws, rules, or customs. They found that those with psychopathy had a moral accuracy that was better than chance. Another study found that psychopaths do, in fact, exhibit regret. But what distinguishes them from non-psychopaths is that they do not avoid regret during decision-making. In other words, they do not use regret to guide their behavior, so they might make rash decisions without any consideration for future consequences. This, and by no means an exhaustive list of research done on psychopaths, and although there have been an overwhelming body of research in this domain, so much is still unknown, especially with regard to treatment. Treatment. It is hard to identify one treatment for psychopathy because there is not a clear cause and no two cases of psychopathy are identical. There is no one drug or one specific form of therapy that has been found to universally reduce the effects of this disorder. As such, treatments must be unique. What works for some might not work for all. Regardless, treatments should aim to reduce substance abuse, remove the association with negative networks, and behavior. A common approach is group therapy, a form of psychotherapy that involves one or more therapists working with people at the same time, or working with several people at the same time. In addition to group therapy, decompression treatment, which emphasizes ways in which positive reinforcement can help and improve behavior, has been successful in reducing recidivism rates among violent juvenile offenders. Despite there not being many surefire treatment methods for psychopaths, this does not mean they can't be really rehabilitated. Famous psychopaths. The behaviors of psychopaths so often deviates from what is considered to be norm, making us fascinated by these individuals. Fictionalized psychopaths are common protagonists in film and television, and real psychopaths often make national headlines when they act in dangerous and brutal ways as a result of their disorder. One of the most famous psychopaths is Ted Bundy who raped and murdered at least 36 women over the course of four years in 1970. But he wasn't just a psychopath because of his violent crimes. Not all psychopaths are heartless killers, and not all heartless killers are psychopaths. What distinguishes Bundy from others is his mask of sanity. That is, on the surface he appeared to be a charming and charismatic individual who people respected and trusted but underneath that mask was a cold-hearted killer. Bundy also carried out his horrific murders without any empathy or remorse, clear marks of psychopathy. Additionally, he admitted to meticulously plotting the gruesome crimes with little to no consideration for the suffering of his victims, the kind of cold-heartedness that is common in psychopaths. Other household psychopaths are Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dahmer, who murdered and dismembered 17 men and boys. Frank Abigail Jr., who was considered one of the most prolific 
con man in U.S. history, Tilly Klimek, a Polish serial killer, and Elizabeth Holmes, the mastermind behind one of the largest biotech scams in history. Fictional psychopaths include Voldemort from Harry Potter, who has no regard for other people's suffering, Patrick Bateman in American Psycho, and Villanelle in Killing Eve who displays no empathy, guilt, or remorse for any of the murders she commits. These famous psychopaths all exhibit characteristics that distinguish psychopaths from any other disorder, that in, uh, any other disorder, including that of ASPD. The next session will dive into what makes ASPD unique and how it differs from psychopathy. What is a sociopath? Sociopathy is also referred to as antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD. People with disorder, with this disorder, don't follow society's norms, are deceitful in personal relationships, and inconsiderate of the rights of others. Sociopaths are highly impulsive, risk-taking, and violent. Unlike psychopathy, in which affective and interpersonal traits are paramount, behavioral traits alone make ASPD unique. ASPD is not a short-term disorder. It is a long-standing pattern of behavior that impairs functional causes distress. ASPD has been studied by numerous psychologists and clinicians. Research generally includes a lifetime prevalence ranging from 1-4% to of the general population, but as with psychopathy, it is less likely among women. <laughs> so specifically, the lifetime prevalence in men is roughly 2-4%, to 4 whereas it ranges from 0.5 to 1% in women. Put differently, males are 3-5 to five times more likely to be diagnosed with ASPD than females. The Origin of Antisocial Personality Disorder ASPD does not have a robust a history of psychopathy beginning in the 1940s. Lee Nelkin Robbins and Sheldon and Eleanor Gluick conducted separate studies on this disorder. Their research revealed the continuity between childhood and adulthood behavioral problems, greatly influencing the diagnostic criteria for ASPD in the DSM-3. Robbins studied 524 subjects in a child guidance clinic between 1922 and 1932 with a follow-up in the 1950s. After analyzing her observations, Robbins concluded that the ASPD is a chronic and persistent disorder that does not remit. 94 of the individuals Robin interviewed from the start met the diagnostic criteria for ASPD. Similarly, the Gluix followed 500 boys between the ages of 10 and 17 who were deemed officially delinquent by the Massachusetts Correctional System. The boys then participated in follow-up interviews at ages 25, 32, and 45, which revealed that antisocial behavior in childhood was strongly linked to adult criminality and deviant behavior. The first version of the DSM, published in 1952, labeled this, this disorder as sociopathic personality disturbance, broken into four sections, or reactions, antisocial, disocial, sexual, and addiction. <clears throat> Why have to put addiction in there? In 1968, DSM-2 listed antisocial personality as one of the 10 personality disorders, but it wasn't until the 1980 DSM-3 that the full term antisocial personality disorder was included. The term is still included in the most recent version, the DSM-5, which is still used to diagnose ASPD today. I think I forgot what year this is put out. But, uh, etiology. As with most disorders, the biggest question is what causes this disorder? And similarly to most answers, it is a combination of both genetic and environmental factors. Although there isn't overwhelming research that examines the heritability of ASPD, a study conducted by Kwang Fu and colleagues relied on an all-male Vietnam-era twin registry sample and observed that 69% of variance was attributed to genetics 
and 31% of that variance was attributed to environmental influences. In terms of genetics, evidence points towards the 2P12, 2P12 region of chromosome. Variation within AVPR1A and variation in the oxytocin receptor gene as having a role in the development of ASPD. Oh, that's a great little fucking chunk of paragraph right there. What the fuck? All right. In terms of genetics, evidence points to... Okay, people have to know these things, but I guess you could read the article, right? You get it, right? Fucking struggling here. <laughs> but genetic mutations are genetically... Are generally not enough. These genes typically have to interact with the environment in order for the individual to actually exhibit signs of the disorder. Research has revealed that environmental factors can range from adverse childhood experience, both physical and sexual abuse, to childhood psychopathology, CD and ADHD, in fucking parentheses, similar to psychopathy, the MAOA variant and reduced amygdala volume also play in the role, a role in making an individual more susceptible to ASPD. As demonstrated by these studies, both genes and the environment play a role in the age-old nature versus nurture debate. DSM-5 Diagnosis, the Major Signs and Symptoms Unlike psychopathy, which has its own unique checklist for diagnosis, ASPD is diagnosed using the DSM-5. In addition to psychological evaluation and analysis of the patient's personal and medical history, the diagnostic criteria listed is as follows. 1. A. A perversive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others since age 15 years, as indicated by three or more of the following. Failure to conform to social norms concerning lawful behaviors, such as performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Deceitfulness, repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for pleasure or personal profit. Impulsivity or failure to plan. Irritability and aggressiveness, often with physical fights or assaults. Reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Consistent irresponsibility. Failures to sustain consistent work behavior or honor monetary obligations. Lack of remorse. Being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another person. The individual is at least 18 years. Evidence of conduct disorder typically with onset before age 15. The occurrence of antisocial behavior is not exclusively during schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. There's a little connectors there. Generally speaking, antisocial personality disorder is described as a pattern of socially irresponsible, exploitive, exploitative, and guiltless behavior. As the DSM indicates, the main symptoms include failure to conform to the law, failure to maintain consistent employment, manipulation, deception, and failure to develop stable interpersonal relationships. Additionally, even though this disorder is not diagnosed until individuals is 18 years old, a patient must have shown some evidence for conduct disorder. The ASPD, ASPD equivalent for children prior to being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Treatment. Antisocial personality disorder is extremely difficult to treat, especially with severe symptoms. It is an extremely complex disorder and can manifest in different ways depending on the individual. Nevertheless, literature suggests certain medications to treat co-occurring conditions. Specifically, aggressive behavior can be treated with a second-generation Antipsychotics, including risperidone and quietapine. Hold on. They called something quietapine or quetapine. Additionally, anticonvulsants such as oxcarbazine, oh, come on, oxcarbazine and Carbamazepine <laughs> can be used to aid when impulsibility, impulsivity. Jesus Christ. 
psychotherapy or talk therapy can also be used to treat ASPD. This approach might incorporate anger and violent management, treatment for alcohol and substance abuse, and treatment for other mental health conditions. The least costly and most effective approach, however, is early treatment intervention with conduct disorder in children. Hmm. Treating ASPD is as complex as the disorder itself is, but research into medication and therapy is certainly promising. I don't know. Hmm. I have a couple of things here ring a little, you know, bells in my head, but I wish I would plan for these things. Next is empirical research. Treatment is not the only domain in which there is research on ASPD. There is an abundance of empirical literature on this disorder, revealing its comorbidity. (laughs) Comorbidity, prevalence, risk factors, and more. Notably, one study found that between the ages of five and adolescence, males manifest more externalizing symptoms than females, whereas females manifest more internalizing symptoms than males. Hmm. However, this sex difference weakens with adolescence. Nevertheless, boys and girls do exhibit different types of antisocial behaviors and aggression, and these differences do extend to adulthood. Another study that observed types of behavior among a younger population looked into different forms of conduct disorder, CD, that might predict future risk for ASPD in women. The researchers found that the types of CD, such as interpersonal and physical aggression, versus destruction of property versus the traditional diagnosis. Rather than the number of behaviors, it is, behaviors, it is a more important indicator for identifying women who might be at risk. Work done by Morizat and Kazmian found that individuals who have a lower IQ are at higher risk for ASPD. You don't say. Hmm. And not surprisingly, due to, to the impulsive nature of ASPD, another study found that substance use disorders are most highly comorbid conditions with ASPD. Hmm. The National Epidemiological Surveys on Alcohol and Related Conditions, a large household study conducted in the U.S., reported that those with ASPD were seven to eight times more likely to meet criteria for alcohol dependence, 15 to 17 times more likely to meet criteria for drug dependence, and five to six times more likely to be nicotine dependent compared to those without ASPD. There are those There are only a few of the many studies that help us understand this extremely complicated disorder as scholars continue to do research on ASPD every day. Famous sociopaths. There are many famous sociopaths, both real and fictional, but two of the most notorious examples are Diane Downs and Alex DeLarge. Downs, a rare female sociopath, murdered her daughter and attempted to kill her other two children. This violent aggression coupled with Dan's decision to lie to the police and claim that a man had attempted to carjack her and shot the children are key indicators of ASPD. Downs was convicted in 1984 and sentenced to life in prison. And she has been diagnosed with narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders. On the fictional side, Alex DeLarge The protagonist of the film A Clockwork Orange that was based on Anthony Burgess's 1962 novel of the same name is another known well, another well-known sociopath. Alex engages in persistent criminal activity, assaulting and murdering numerous innocent people, and after a short stay in prison, he is committed to a mental hospital to undergo rehabilitative treatment. Alex's actions demonstrate clear moral depravity, and he has no sense of shame when he carries out these brutal acts. He consistently fails. Oops. I messed it up. 
to obey the law and has a strong drug addiction and only has defect social relationships. He is manipulative, deceptive, and impulsive. And at the beginning of the story, Alex is only 15 years old, meeting the ASPD requirement that the individual exhibits signs of CD before an official diagnostic at 18 years or older. Alex DeLarge is a textbook sociopath. Uh, it says a little bit about the author, Charlotte Roll, member of 2022 at Harvard, uh, study psychology, a minor in African studies, fact checking. Simple psychology content is regularly reviewed, rigorously reviewed by a team of qualified and expert fact checkers. Fact checkers review articles for factual accuracy, relevance, and timeless, timeliness. We rely on the most reputable sources. Which is cited. Okay, that's why they cite and everything. Now, that's it. We're done. This was fucking brutal. But it tends to be in these type of things. The other article I was looking at was from the uh, Mental Health of America. And it goes into psychopathy versus sociopathy. And, you know, it talks about Hollywood and you know, the things that could... There's a lot of overlap. And I, I think I chose that one because it had the etymology and the empirical research sections. This one goes on like it has a little bit more about which is more dangerous. And um, both psychopaths and sociopaths present risk to society because they will often try to live a normal life while coping with the disorder. But psychopathy is likely to be more dangerous disorder because they experience a lot less guilt connected to their actions. A psychopath also has a greater ability to dis dissociate from their actions without emotional involvement. Any pain that others suffer is meaningless to a psychopath. Many f famous serial killers have been psychopaths. So, you know, and it gives you a little bit about clues. It's a lot like the other one. I don't want to go through it all. I think this has been like a real fucking long one. A lot of flubs and all messed up shit. So I'm going to end this. I implore everybody to do their own research. You know, when you read these things and you go through some of the little things that you learn through life and you practice, you start to see, you know, flaws in even some of the really deep research and even descriptions of these. Some call them fallacies and they'll call it like um, circling the mark. It's like shooting an arrow into a tree. And then, drawing the circle and the bullseye. There are ways you can manipulate numbers and statistics, and it obviously keeps going to with social norms. And So, there's a lot of nuance to this, but just bringing up the subject, talking about it, understanding manipulation and what these tendencies are, is important, I think. And you could look into this and never take my word for anything. There's a whole world out there that I'm oblivious to, and I do try my best to at least, you know, verify some things. So I look at websites with good sources and so on and so forth. But in, when the institution has uh, fallacies and there are problems within it, it does breed certain w methods and trends that are part of society that aren't technically proper. And does that mean that if I'm going against it or people go against it, it's part of this so there's a balance here but i do want to you know stress the importance of looking into these things and just knowing about them understanding and maybe getting a little excited and you know uh, curio curious about how the human brain works and what's going on you know 24 hours a day in this fucking brain we have so I apologize for all the flubs. I'll put the link for the article in the description. Thank you so much for joining me and getting through this fucking hour, near hour long thing. Holy shit. Thank you. But we have sociopath versus psychopath. And it is a crazy world out there. So I hope you all are doing well. The best of mental health to everybody. And try to remember to breathe. Three to five seconds into the nose, 
five to eight seconds out through the mouth. And if you have breathing issues, the point is longer out through the mouth. And it's your focus, it's your release, it's your balance. So I'll talk to you all next time. Take care.